Later we discuss how these ideas of gradient descent could be applied in higher dimensions. And the problem is that we need to evaluate this gradient, which is a gradient of a function, and you can see that the dimension is related to the number of weights. Remember that each neuron, for instance using a sigmoid, has one bias and one weight for depending on the number of neurons in the previous layer. So you, you can see that this is going to explode exponentially. So what's the best way to calculate those weights in an efficient way? Because you, we cannot do this mathematically. So let me show you an idea. And this idea is the following. Instead of calculating the gradient numerically, and basically using the definition of derivation, which is the rate of change in y divided by the rate of change in x, what we are going to do is use this idea by this guy, by Paul Werbos, and the idea is the following. Imagine that you have a landscape in two dimensions. Instead of calculating at each point what is the direction of the maximum variation of the gradient, we're going to do this incrementally. So we're going to do a guess. So more or less we could say that our first guess could be completely random, the next guess would be something like the here you have a river, or here you have a, a, a mountain, or a valley, or whatever, and then improve on that iteration. So let me show you how to do that. So this is our error function, and again, this is specifically for regression, but the ideas can be extended to, to the likelihood in the case of classification, and we want to evaluate this number uh, subject to some restrictions. Okay. So if we take the gradient, basically what we are doing is creating a new matrix in, in which each element of the matrix is the partial derivative of the error uh, with respect to this weight. Okay, to, to show you what we did before, uh, previously we have just a couple of parameters in this linear regression. This is the bias or the intercept, and this is the slope or the first weight. So here the function is very simple, but even in this case, this gradient is a matrix of two elements or a vector of two elements. So the first element as you can see here is the partial derivative of this with respect to w0 and the second element is the partial derivative with respect to w1 okay so here's the idea of back propagation we don't know how to do this in general because this is going to be mathematically impossible when we are coupling neurons and neurons but let's do this iteratively so let's uh, start with a very simple neuron we have one bias and one weight and the first step is to guess the initial weights so this could be random there are some criteria to initialize this, but in, in principle we can take whatever we want. The first step now is to estimate y according to these weights. Of course this y is going to be completely uh, completely far apart from the real solution, but, but let's calculate that. And then we can calculate the error. So let's take the real one, the estimated one, and then subtract those numbers, a square, sum all over all the values, and that's all. Remember that here x1 takes a lot of values, so we are repeating this over and over again, so we are completing for each row in our data file, we're going to have one y, okay? Now, let's compute the gradient, I'm going to show you later how to do that. For one new neuron, this is very simple, remember, this is for linear regression, but for logistic regression, we will have something like this times an exponential. And then we are going to use this gradient to improve, to learn, according to the algorithm that we proposed the other day, to learn the new weights. And this is called back propagation because basically we are using the gradient from the previous step in the next step. Okay? What if we have now a couple of layers? So one neuron at the end and one neuron before. So what's new in here? Well, you can see the following. I, mathematically, you assume that this is linear and this is also linear. Actually, the output is something like this is the, the first bias uh, and the second uh, weight, sorry, the first weight and the second weight multiplied by what is coming from the previous layer. So this thing in red is the output of the first layer and actually it depends on the input x and this is going to be propagating forward until we have the exit. But as you can see here, mathematically this form is more or less like this. We have replaced the x in this simple example by this part in red which is the output of this neuron. Okay, so the main idea is the following. We are going to treat each neuron as the same and we are going to change the value of the input. So this is mathematics, this is called the chain rule. So let me show you how. The partial derivative of E with respect to the weight can be computed in the following way. So the, the, the error is going to be calculated at the last step, but this step depends on the output S of the previous step. So let's call S the signals coming from the previous layer. And actually you can see that you can extend this to any size and any number of hidden layers. Okay, and now uh, times the partial derivative of these signals with respect to the weights. Okay, if we do this, do this over and over again, we can go back to the number of layers that we want. Okay, 
In the first layer, in this case this is a, a multi-layer perceptron but with just one hidden layer, in the first layer this partial derivative is simply the input, because if you remember, we are multiplying each weight times x and this is a constant, okay? So actually what we are applying here is the numbers that we are using in our data set. And in this part we are computing the gradient but not using the x but using the s, the s coming from the previous layer. So in the end, the partial derivative of the error with respect to the weights is the multiplication of what's going on independently in each of the layers. And computing this, these layers is very simple and we don't need to backpropagate the derivative, we just need to backpropagate the numbers, not the functions. Okay? As I was saying, what I have explained just works for regression, and regression you have a continuous number at the output, but when you have discrete numbers like classes, like 0 and 1, yes or no, survive or die or whatever, we have to change this for likelihood, and the likelihood basically means that we are replacing the classes by 0 and 1, you can extend this to any dimension, but stick to 0 and 1 here, and compute the so-called kullback leibler divergence, which is more or less the entropy difference between this couple of probabilities y and hat y. Okay, but forget about that. Anyway, let's go back to our metaphor. So this is a landscape, this is another landscape, and as you can see here you have a lot of differences between those landscapes. So we have a very rough uh, uh, skyline here and a very smooth, smooth profile here. So of course this is going to be easier to train than this one. Why? Because in this case we have a lot of places in which we could be stuck even using momentum. So how can we improve fitting or how can we improve this idea of backpropagation without the sticking in a place that depends as strongly on the initial guess of the weights? Okay, you can see uh, again the metaphor here. So this is a landscape, very rough landscape. And the problem is that even with momentum or the, because of lack of momentum we could end up here. But even with momentum we could end up here and this is because we are searching a lot, but just in a restricted part of, of the graph. So what we want here is basically instead of sticking to the first minimum that sounds reasonable, instead to the global minimum of the curve. Mathematically, what we are going to do is add some constraint here. This is a, a, a penalty to the minimization function. And mathematically, if all the weights are equal, this is called Lagrange, uh, Lagrange multiplier. Essentially, what we are doing here is trying to find the minimum of the error but with some restrictions and you can replace this by a number so you could write here something like wk squared minus 1 or minus 10 or whatever and that means that uh, we are constraining all the weights to have a specific values that other together square are going to be 1, 10 or whatever number we put here. So without adding a number basically what we are doing here is constraining or restricting some of the values to be very high because this is going to be uh, very costly. So it's much uh, cheaper if all the weights are low that if you have one weight which is far away from the mean and the other is far away from the mean in the other direction. So this is called L2 regularization and the, the 2 here means that this is the, the Lebesgue norm of order 2, so we have a square here. There are other regularizations like L1 that basically just tries to to penalty according to the absolute value of the weight. I prefer uh, L2 for one reason. Here, when you take the partial derivative of this function, this is going to be the sign of the weight, so plus one or minus one. So this is going to give you the direction, but not the magnitude of the penalty. When you use uh, L2 regularization, you're also penal you have some penalty for the absolute value. So if you are far away from the mean, this is going to be a very costly. Let's see some examples. So what if we have uh, 15 uh, hidden neurons and we have no penalty and we are training for a short period of time. Remember that the, the, the longer we train our network, uh, the, the, the more overfitting are you going to do because you're going to try to feed those uh, small idiosyncrasies in, in your data. Okay, so in this case we, we have very short training and as you can see with short training the best that you can do is actually a kind of logistic regression because you are just separating the world in a couple of values. When you increase the number of uh, trainings, then you're moving around that landscape and you can find something that is much better. But be careful because if you train uh, a lot, then you're going to try to explain things like this couple of points there and this couple of points there implies that you're going to create a region here that doesn't exist. So the problem with overtraining is that each new epoch, e each new 
step in the backpropagation algorithm is going to try to explain things that are outliers, so like this number here or these numbers there. Okay, so uh, when you don't have any penalty, the best thing that you can do is to stop early. What if we add some penalty? Well, at the beginning, we need more time in order to have a good convergence, but the good thing is that this line is bad, but after 10, you have this boundary, which is pretty good. And even if you increase the number of epochs to uh, 200, for instance, then, well, okay, your boundary is going to be very reasonable. You still have some problems here because you're trying to fit those two outliers, but you cannot see that in the boundary. So you use this as a classifier, this is going to perform really well. What if we use a very high penalty? In this case, you, what you are minimizing is the, the, the absolute value of the weights. So all the weights are going to be equal. And if you have all the weights equal, you can replace, you can show more or less that your neural network is a kind of logistic regression. And it, if you have three layers, it would be the sigmoid of a sigmoid of a sigmoid. But in the end, this is a kind of logistic regression. So the best that you can do is something like that. It's a straight line. So y there is a trade-off between the number of epochs and the lambda. And, and you can learn this by cross-validation, or you can do this by experience, or trial and error, or, or and so on and so forth. L let me show you an example. If lambda is a small, then uh, you can learn very fast, because after 150 steps, the, the error is not going to reduce any further. If lambda is zero, maybe your total error is lower because you're overfitting, but you need more iterations. So one way to compensate for this value is to use, when, when you have lambda zero, is to use less iteration, as you can see here. Well, it's been a tour de force, a lot of information, but I think, I, I hope that this is going to be useful for you.